In keeping with our standard operating procedure, the next few moments are devoted to silent prayer, giving each of you the privacy of your priesthood to name your sins to God if necessary. If we name our sins to God, we are filled with God the Holy Spirit. Therefore, with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, let us pray. Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity to assemble ourselves together for the purpose of learning the Word of God. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us concerning the things that we note so that we might grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. Now today we're going to have a bit of revert, of review. So turn in your Bibles to uh, Matthew chapter 23. Verse 37. Matthew chapter 23, verse 37. Now in Matthew 23, 37, we have the judgment on Israel. And this is a background for the Olivet Discourse. Now what we have here are the unconditional covenants. The reason why our Lord is dealing so heavily with Israel is because he has covenants to Israel. And there are actually four unconditional covenants to the nation of Israel. And these covenants are as follows. I will do thus and so for you, etc. And then the next covenant, I will do thus and so for you. Next covenant, I will do this for you. Next covenant, I will do this for you. None of it depends upon Israel whatsoever. It all depends on the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we have the four unconditional covenants. And the covenants start out as uh, God saying, I will. God says, I will. And that's part of the covenant. So point one, we have the Abrahamic covenant. The Abrahamic covenant. This is where God says, I will form out of you a nation. The Abrahamic covenant. That's God's will. And God says, I will form out of Abraham a covenant. Or I will form out of Abraham a nation. Uh, and one thing we need to note about this is even though Abraham was never perfect, he never was perfect, that God still allowed him to have this covenant. And Abraham slept with uh, the slave woman. In effect, he committed adultery. And yet, the covenant was still fulfilled because this was an I will covenant, an unconditional covenant. No matter what Abraham did, this covenant would be fulfilled. So first of all, we have the Abrahamic covenant. Then we have the Palestinian, the Palestinian covenant. Point two, the Palestinian covenant. And in the Palestinian covenant, God promises to the Jews a piece of real estate they have not occupied until this very moment. They still haven't occupied it. Oh, there's a little, little sliver of land called Israel, but they do not occupy what is the Palestinian covenant, which goes all the way over to the Euphrates Sea, in which, or the Euphrates River, in which they will own everything from the peninsula of uh, Saudi Arabia all the way up through Turkey, and they will own just about the entire Middle East. So we have the Palestinian covenant. Then number three, we have the Davidic Covenant. The Davidic Covenant. And under the Davidic Covenant, this tells uh, David that Jesus Christ will reign forever. And Jesus Christ will come from David. Uh, that is, he is the son of David. And he will reign forever. King of kings and Lord of lords. He will reign over us forever. And then the fourth covenant is the new covenant to Israel. And this is where all regenerate Jews of past dispensations will have eternal life under certain conditions which is specified in Hebrews 8, 8 through 13. So the new covenant to Israel is all regenerate Jews of past dispensations and they will have eternal life under conditions which is specified in Hebrews 8. 8 through 13. Now in this we must get down the three different types of Jews. 
And that's because so many Jews today don't even know if they're a Jew or not. And so we start out with point one, the racial Jew. And the racial Jew has the genes of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And if you have one-tenth of the genes of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, you're a Jew. If you have uh, one-twentieth uh, one of the genes of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, you're a Jew. And this is racial Jew. There is a racial Jew. And then secondly, we have the religious Jew. And the religious Jew is the apostate legalist. And there are a lot of religious Jews. Many of them are, are of the religious race, and many of them uh, are not of the, of the race, but they are religious. So we have the religious Jew, and they are apostate legalist. Then we have number three, the regenerate Jew. And the regenerate Jew deals with the Old Testament Jew who has believed in Christ. Either the Old Testament Jew who has believed in Christ, or the tri tribulational Jew who has believed in Christ. Now, if any Jew believes in Christ during the church age, they are no longer a Jew. They are royal family of God. Just as when you believe in Jesus Christ, you become royal family of God. And when you believe in Christ, you have the privilege of being royal family of God. And when you believe in Jesus Christ, you have the privilege of having 39 irrevocable absolutes. Something that was never given in the past. Something that will never be given in the future in the tribulation. We have something far above and beyond what will ever be given in any time. We are in the church age. We are in the age in which we have 39 irrevocable absolutes to anyone who believes in Christ, Jew or Gentile. We have two power options, three spiritual skills, four spiritual mechanics, ten problem-solving devices, things that have never been available before or since. What happens in the tribulation? The Jews go back to the faith rest drill. They don't even have the filling of God the Holy Spirit. Do you know we right here have the opportunity for the filling of God the Holy Spirit? We have that opportunity. The only thing we have to do is name our sins to God, be filled with God the Holy Spirit, and fulfill our unique spiritual life. And that means we have something far above and beyond what they will have in the tribulation, something far above and beyond what they had during the time of David, something far above and beyond what they had during the time of Moses. So right now is the time in which we have the most unique spiritual life. But since we're dealing with Matthew, we must deal with what's going on during this time. Now the regenerate Jew, again, deals with Old Testament Jew who has believed in Christ, or the Jew who has believed in Christ in the tribulation. Any Jew who believes in Christ during this church age becomes royal family of God, just as we are royal family of God, and there's no distinction. Now we must learn something about the Jew. The Jew was given a client nation, and this client nation at times succeeded, and at times this client nation failed. Now in 781 B.C., the fourth cycle of discipline was administered to Israel. This is 781 B.C. This is when Israel had went away from the uh, Word of God. They had rejected the Word of God. They had, been, they had become stubborn against the Word of God. They had been, become arrogant in which they would not listen to the Word of God. So God issued to them the fourth cycle of discipline, and this was administered under uh, three different na nations. First of all, it was administered under Assyria. Secondly, it was administered under Egypt. And thirdly, it was administered under the Chaldeans. Now, oftentimes, this is misconstrued as the Babylonian captivity. It wasn't the Babylonian captivity. These were Chaldeans. And it was the Chaldean captivity. And then in 586, the Chaldeans, not the Babylonians, administered the, five, the fifth cycle of discipline. So from 781 B.C. they were under the fourth cycle, and then in 586 they finally went under the fifth cycle. But then in 516 through 323 B.C., 516 through 323 B.C., 
This was the greatest period of Israel that they had ever seen until the millennium. This was a time when many people got with the word of God. This was an age in which they applied doctrine, in which the people in the land used doctrine. And because of that, they had 200 years of peace and prosperity. And this would be from 516 to 323. From 516 to 323, this was the greatest period of Israel until the millennium. And this is the age in which they applied doctrine and they had 200 years of peace and prosperity. Then in 323, they began to decline. People became arrogant. They didn't like the Word of God. They didn't like the way the Word of God stepped on their little bitty toes. So from 323, they began to decline and went... And until, and then they went from 323 in decline, and in 167, they went under the fourth cycle of discipline. Now, this fourth cycle of discipline was short. They woke up. The fourth cycle of discipline came, and they were taken over, and they would rather live their unique spiritual life that they had at that time. And so, a family, a very famous family called the Hasmoneans, and the Hasmoneans were a famous family who loved the Word of God. And this would be the type of family that says, I care not what you may do, but as for me and my family, I will serve the Lord. And so the Hasmoneans served the Lord, and they won the freedom for Israel in 164. So they, after 160, you see in 167, they went under the four cycle of discipline. Then in 164, they broke free. They actually had a battle and won their independence, and they broke free in 164 under the Hasmonean family. Then they had a short period of prosperity all the way up until 63 B.C. So from 164 to 63 B.C., there was freedom. But then in 63 uh, B.C., Pompey the Great entered Jerusalem, and then the fourth cycle, fourth cycle of discipline was administered again. And they went under the fourth cycle of discipline in 63 B.C., and that lasted all the way until 70 A.D. And in August of 70 A.D., they went under the fifth cycle of discipline because no one would wake up to Christ. No one would wake up to Bible doctrine. Everyone was very arrogant. So Israel failed. Now, the church, as a result, the church now replaces Israel as the custodians of the Word of God. We are the custodians of the Word of God. And as the United States of America, we are especially the custodians of the Word of God. And we send out missionaries and all sorts of things all around the world in order that people will believe in Christ and get with the Word of God. And yesterday I, I, I read to you a, a letter from India in which a man was very grateful for the MP3s I had sent to him and he gave us pictures of his uh, a, a Sunday school class and everything. And it was uh, quite encouraging, at least for me, to see that uh, people around the world are getting with the Word of God more so than they are here in the United States. He was more grateful for the Word than uh, most people I've ever come in contact with. So one of the weird things is, uh, well, what we have here is the church now replaces Israel as a custodian of the Word of God. And what we need to note is uh, one, one thing I haven't talked about much and I should have talked about earlier. And that's the fact that if you've been in churches and they have been talking about Matthew or if they've been talking about Acts, one thing that I failed to mention is that uh, a lot of people get kind of self-righteous and say, do you know what? If I was back there during the days of our Lord Jesus Christ, I would have followed Christ everywhere. If I would have seen the Lord Jesus Christ in His face, I would have followed Him down the streets. I would have knelt before Him all the time. I would have followed Him and done everything He said. And the truth that well... Guess what? You've got the Word of God today. Do you follow the Word of God? Are you salivating over the Word of God? You say you would salivate over Christ? What is Christ? Well, it's the Word. And if are you salivating over the Word of God? If not, you would be a failure just like all the others. And you think you're greater than Peter, James, and John? And Peter, James, and John failed a lot in the beginning, but they got with it later later. 
But do you think for one moment uh, that uh, just because uh, you could have lived during that time, you would have followed Christ everywhere? It's a lie. If you can't follow doctrine day by day, you can't follow the Lord. The Lord has given us the Word of God. That is His thinking. If you cannot follow the thinking of Christ day by day, one hour a day, one simple hour a day, except for Saturday, you even get a break, and then two on Sunday. If you can't follow the Lord for that amount of time in listening to His Word, you would have never followed Him when He was on the earth. Never. And that's a fact, and I know it to be true. And that's a weird thing about a lot of people. If I had been back then, I would have followed the Lord. No, you wouldn't. You can follow the Lord right now by listening to the Word and follow Him in an even greater experience because you have the church age doctrines, because you have the filling of God, the Holy Spirit, something the, the disciples did not have. The disciples did not have the filling of God, the Holy Spirit. They were handicapped. We have the filling of God, the Holy Spirit. And for us to be so arrogant to say, well, those disciples were stupid, I would follow those disciples. I would, I mean, excuse me, I would follow Jesus. You're wrong. If you don't follow Him today in His Word, you wouldn't have followed Him then. And this is His Word that comes out. And if you say, well, you're just a man teaching it. Well, I'm filled with God, the Holy Spirit, and I'm teaching you the Word, accept it or reject it. This is my job that God gave to me. You can either accept it or reject it, but I'm not going to give it to you falsely. Otherwise, punishment would come down on me, and that's the last thing I want. So 23:27 is when our Lord takes a look at Jerusalem. And he's probably on a hill, probably somewhere near the Mount of Olives, and he's looking down on Jerusalem. And he says this while his disciples are all gathered around him. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her? How many times I wanted to gather your children together. You see, they were stiff-necked. That's why he uses the uh, idea of chicks here. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her? Those who are sent to her, these are two examples of negative volition expressed through religion. The people became religious, therefore they did not accept Jesus Christ. How many times I wanted to gather your children together. But they weren't gathered together because they were stiff-necked. Like a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. And what we can see by this is uh, usually chicks under the wings of a chicken... Uh, will follow right under the wings of the chicken. But the Israelites are stiff-necked and they're all wandering everywhere. And every time the mother would take her wing and try to swoop them in, they would run away. They were stiff-necked people. But you were not willing. They were not willing to learn the Word of God. But guess what? Even though they weren't willing, what happened? Well, it's pretty much silent after that, isn't it? All, the only thing that's said is, but you were not willing. Well, what, mean, we, what we must understand from this is that God is a gentleman. If you become stiff-necked toward the Word of God, if you say, I don't care for the Word of God, if you say, I want to uh, go on happily in my arrogance, if you say, I don't give a darn, then guess what? God is a gentleman. And if people are negative... He allows them to be negative. He allows it. He wouldn't have it any other way. That's why you'll never see me knocking on doors. You know, the, the biggest problem with churches today is they uh, get a congregation and they start looking at people and they want to go up and knock on doors and say, where have you been? Why don't you get back to church? Uh, etc., etc., or try to make them feel good and say, we miss you and your presence and your fellowship, etc., which is all a lie. He misses the 10% money. But what they're really uh, doing here is they are not acting as gentlemen. Well, if tonight the only person I had here was one and that was the only person I would have for the next uh, week or two, guess what? I'm not going to go around knocking on doors saying, where the hell have you been? None of my business. In fact, I must act as God would because God is a gentleman. 
And if people are negative and they don't care to listen to the Word of God, He allows them to be negative. And in fact, He doesn't smite them off the face of the earth immediately. But we as humans might like that. As humans, we might say, Oh, so-and-so's negative. May they die tomorrow. But God's gracious. And God knows more about them people than we ever will. And maybe when they're 50, 60, 65, or maybe when they're on their deathbed, they might get with the Word of God. Maybe they will. And that's not for us to judge. But our Lord's a gentleman, and He doesn't run up to people's houses and say, Where have you been? He leaves them alone. says, All right. You're negative, you're negative. That's your choice. And there are consequences to choices, by the way. And while they may not be felt immediately, and they won't be felt immediately, they will be felt in eternity when you go before the King of Kings and Lord of Lords and He comes down and He evaluates you in the Bema. And when the Bema throne comes down and says, What did you do with this unique spiritual life if you have nothing to show? You'll be without reward. And all those people you gossiped about, maligned about, and judged, they'll be there with rewards and crowns like you've never seen before. And it's going to be a humiliating time for you. Hopefully it'll be a short time of humiliation. So now what we need to recognize is will. We see here that uh, God, we have the will of God, we have the will of angels, and we have the will of man. These are three wills. And we see here that the will of God does not mess with the will of man. If the will of man says, nah, I don't care for it, then God acts as a gentleman. Just as we should, by the way. Now, with children, it's different. With children, it's up to the husband, the authority, to say, you must go to church. But with the... Uh, but with the wife, he has no say over whether she goes to church or not. That's never, ever commanded. Never. And if the wife wants to go to her Pentecostal, Baptist, whatever church she wants to go to, that's her free will. That is the way God set it up. God is a gentleman. And when we go into the sanctity of marriage, we are to be gentlemen with our wives. And that's just the simple, it's a simple fact. It's hard to do. I could imagine it. I could imagine it because if, if my wife were to reject the Word of God, I would probably, most definitely, uh, most definitely be highly, highly irritated by that. And I would be highly irritated by that, but uh, I would be out of line. I married her. I knew what she was before I married her. And if, uh, for example, I've known, uh, well, I've known people in my own family who were positive toward the Word, both husband and wife positive toward the Word, and suddenly the husband went off the deep end. He said, I don't care for the Word of God anymore. Well, guess what? She had no power to force him into being positive. And we don't. We must live our own lives as unto the Lord. And while we're married, we're, we are still distinct individuals individuals in which we both have volition, either positive or negative. Now, when it comes to children, they're under the exclusive authority of mother and father, and when the mother and father have a disagreement, it comes down to the father. The father is the ultimate authority always, and I say this not as a chauvinistic pig, but as somebody who knows Scripture, and I know that the father is the last uh, is the last authority. So if the father says, children, you'll go to church, well, that's fine. But you cannot force your spouse into anything. It will only cause, uh, what should I say, resentment. Not only will she resent you, she will resent the message. She'll resent uh, everything about the message. And uh, instead of that, let her go. Let her go on her own. And that is what... That is why God is a gentleman here in the Scripture. He's a gentleman. I mean, look. I mean, here, here's his own children, Israel. Let me pull it back out just so that you understand. His own children, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. His own children of Israel. And they are like him who gathers her chicks under her wings, but you are not willing. But there's nothing after that. 
There's no mention of the uh, chicks being beaten back into the fold. No, if they're not willing, they're not willing. Lord let them go. He said, all right, you do what you do. But now we must get down to will. And will is very important because we have the will of God, the will of angels, and the will of man. So we come down, finally, to the history of humans. So point one, let's take this down. We have the will of God. Point two, we have the will of angels. Point three, we have the will of men or man. And in history, we have a conflict of wills. And we start out with religion because religion is the biggest, uh, well, it's the sideshow. It's the biggest sideshow for the will of man. And uh, because uh, it is God's will that everyone be saved, Satan came up with a counterfeit and said, Hey, I got something for you. It's called religion. So in religion, man does the doing. In religion, man does the doing. And, and God is supposed to receive what man does. Therefore, man gets the credit. In religion, man does the doing, and God does the receiving, and God gets, or excuse me, God does, in religion, man does the doing, and God is supposed to receive what man does, therefore man gets the credit. In religion, man does the doing, and God is supposed to receive what man does, therefore man gets the credit. Under grace, God does the work. Under grace, God does the work. Man does the receiving, and God gets all the credit. Jesus Christ died on the cross as a substitute for all of us. It was His work. Therefore, when we believe in Him, God gets all the credit. We did nothing. And it's terrible today that so many in religion and in churches today think that they can be good, think that they can follow some type of taboo and go to heaven when God did all the work, when Jesus Christ died on the cross as a substitute for everyone. And since Jesus Christ died on the cross as a substitute for everyone, the only way of salvation is faith alone in Christ alone. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. And that is the only way of salvation. And so the principle comes down to this. Do you not want God to get the credit? And that's the principle. If you decide to follow religion, you don't want God to get the credit. You want yourself to get the credit. Do you not want God to get the credit? Or are you so full of yourself that you would rather receive the credit that should go straight to God. And if you answer that way, you're no better than Satan. No better. Satan wants credit. Satan wants credit that he is like the Most High God. And if you think that you're saved by your works, if you think that you're saved by how good you are, you're no better than Satan. We can never be as good as God. We're human beings with sin natures. How could we ever ever get to the status of God. We can't. Therefore, grace is provided. And Jesus Christ came down and died as a substitute for us on the cross. And He came down. He didn't have to. He left glory. He left the glory of heaven. He left everything that was uh, miraculous and, and uh, absolutely stupendous and beautiful left it all to come down to this frail earth and then to die as a substitute for us on the cross and have nails shoved through his hands and through his feet. And that wasn't the worst of it all. Then all of our sins were imputed to him and judged. And he did all that on our account. That's love. And for us to say we can be saved on our own is to ignore the love of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's to spit on it. And if you say, I can get to heaven by some works I can do, you're spitting on the Lord. If you say, I can get into heaven because I do not do this and do not do that, or because I do this and do thus and the other thing, you are spitting on the Lord. The Lord died on the cross as a substitute for us. 
in which all of our sins were imputed to Him and judged. And the only thing we have to do is believe in Him. And when we believe in Him, we receive eternal salvation. And therefore, we don't spit on the Lord, but we live with Him as family forever. But religion, uh, what religion does is, uh, religion wants to give the credit to ourselves instead of to God. And God gives, gets all the credit. God should always get all the credit. Yet religion is so full of itself that it wants to say, I did something to be saved, and they did nothing to be saved, and they're all destined for hell. And it's going to be a, a terrible thing when they get to the last judgment. Now we move on to Jerusalem. And Jerusalem is depicted as a religious city that demonstrates maximum negative volition in that it kills the prophets. Jerusalem has, over the years, killed the prophets. Negative volition opens a vacuum in the soul, causing it to be filled with legalism. And they always express themselves in antagonism of grace. When you reject the gospel, if you are unsaved and you reject the gospel, you're going to open up in your soul the vacuum, the same thing believers do, the matiotes. And you're going to suck in there all types of religious ideas. And you're going to begin to express yourself in antagonism to grace. You're going to hate grace. Anyone tells you about grace and how you're saved by faith alone in Christ alone, and they are going to attack you. And uh, some of you may wonder why you're attacked sometimes. You might be a fairly nice fellow or a fairly nice girl. And then uh, you uh, give the gospel or you teach grace, and suddenly you are the target of the most vicious, heinous attacks ever. The reason? It's very simple. Religion. Religion is antagonistic toward grace. And most churches around here and around the country, not just here in Anderson, but around the country, are antagonistic toward grace. There's no way I would walk myself into a church today around here or around any part of the country except uh, Baraka Church in Houston. I know those people down there and they teach grace, so I would be uh, familiar with that. Or maybe uh, Ted Lesti Church in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Or maybe uh, even Joe Griffin in... Uh, uh, St. Louis, Missouri. But other than that, uh, walking into any church just around here, you are asking for trouble. I would never walk into a church like that, and I would definitely never let them know what I believe, because as soon as you start teaching grace, they're ready to chop your head off. They're ready to destroy you. So the more you understand grace, the more you live and let live. And when you start to understand grace, the more you live and let live. That is, you stop, uh, well, you uh, cut off your long proboscis. We've all heard of Pinocchio. Pinocchio had a long nose. He lied all the time. Well, when you learn grace, you cut off that nose. You're not in everyone else's business. So the more you understand grace, the more you live and let live. The more you understand grace, the more you mind your own business. And the fewer illusions you have about yourself and about others. A lot of times, the, uh, a lot of trouble begins in Christian relationship between humans is because they have illusions about one another. And one person thinks that somebody is great, and therefore that great person lets them down, and so now they have iconoclastic arrogance, and they want to rip that person apart. That's not Christian relationship. That's terrible. If you had any type of spiritual growth, you would have impersonal love in which you would realize that all of us are sinners and that even when we are wronged, it doesn't matter. We can uh, overcome it through grace. So when, you are, so when you are religious, you are... Well, let's get this down. When you are religious... Well, when you are religious... The, the antithesis is true. In other words, you don't believe the truth. When you're religious, you don't believe the truth. You're against the truth. And when you're religious, religion bullies. Religion bullies. Religions tell, religion tells people what to wear, how to wear their hair, whether or not to wear makeup, whether or not to wear a skirt above a certain length. 
whether or not to do this or that or the other thing. Religion bullies. Religion is pushy. Religion is pushy in that uh, under religion, if someone sees you smoking a cigarette or drinking a beer, how dare you do that? Don't you know that your body is the temple of the Lord? And they'll say that not understanding the scripture, not understanding what that scripture means, and it's a bully. Religion persecutes. Religion persecutes. What I mean by that is if you are grace-oriented and you are in an environment where there are a lot of religious people around, they're going to persecute you. And they're going to persecute you on the basis of how you act and what you do and how great a sinner you are. And religion finally makes it miserable for others. If you're religious, you're going to try to make it miserable for others. Grace doesn't function in that way. 24.1 Now as Jesus was going out of the temple courts and walking away, His disciples came to show Him the temple buildings. Now as Jesus was going out of the temple courts and walking away, here we get something that uh, your English teachers would say, you're being redundant. And in fact, in the Greek, it is being redundant. And what it's really saying is, now Jesus is leaving the temple courts and walking away. Well, that's redundant. If he's leaving, he's walking away. Why say both? Because remember, in the Greek, there are two different meanings to walking away and leaving. The Greek was a well-detailed language. And it was a very intensified language that dealt with the human psyche. Now, you can leave physically, and you can leave spiritually, or you can leave mentally. And that is what it gets from the uh, Greek here. Now, as Jesus was going out of the temple courts, that is mental separation. He separates himself mentally from the temple courts and walking away. And he separates himself physically from the temple courts. He's separating, right now what he's doing, he's separating himself from religion. He's separating himself from the temple courts and walking away. He's leaving them. He had just chewed them out. He had just told them everything that they needed to know and they had rejected him and they were like hens who had stiff necks And he says, look, I'm done with you. I'm walking away from you, and I don't even think about you anymore. He completely separates himself from these people the same way we should. We should never be caught in some religious organization. We should never be caught in some uh, religious church. Never. Because they will suck us away into apostasy. The worst thing, uh, the worst thing we could do is uh, go into some uh, church anywhere in the country that is religious, and uh, either one try to change them. If you try to change them, you'll become just like them. Or two, uh, just to get along to have some type of uh, fellowship, you'll become religious just like they were. And our Lord sets the precedence by leaving them and separating Himself from religion. Then his disciples came to show him the temple buildings. Point one, he went out and departed. And that's what it says in the Greek. He went out and departed. And this is a continuous policy because it's linear action sort. A continuous continuous policy, meaning that no believer should have anything to do with religion. Separate yourself from religion and religious organizations. And that's what it means. And that's why it's linear action start. And that's why it's repeated. And it's not redundant. It's just the way our Lord wants us to do. Then in 24.2, And he answered them. You see the disciples were busy looking at buildings. They were looking, they were looking at the building of Herod. And the... Uh, that Herod built the temple, by the way. And he answered them, Stop looking at the buildings. I tell you the truth, not 
One stone will be left here on another and will be torn down. The disciples were enamored by the buildings. And, no, and there's no doubt that the temple was very beautiful to the disciples. Probably the first time they had come to see it. And it was very beautiful. And they uh, actually told our Lord, they said, Lord, look at this temple. But that wasn't the issue. And the disciples were admiring something that is totally inconsequential. A building. So what? I remember uh, back when I was uh, working at the mental health center, uh, a lady was there, and there is a very beautiful church in Spartanburg. It's a, um, it's not a Pentecostal church, but it's a, uh, it's a, it's not Methodist either. We got Methodist, what do we got? Methodist and Baptist. What would be besides the Methodist? Methodist, Baptist, and come on now, you got to know all these uh, denominations. No, it was, uh, I think it starts with a P, but it's not Pentecostal. Presbyterian. Presbyterian. Zach, I need to give you a dollar. It's a Presbyterian. <laughs> and a Presbyterian, and it's very beautiful. It's an old style Presbyterian church, and it is gorgeous. And it's got those old stones, etc. And I remember being at, at work and hearing her talk about that beautiful church and how she liked to go there. Not because of what was taught, but because it was so beautiful. She, oh, that church is so beautiful. I love to just look at it. And then she would say, and then I would go in the church and, and just look at all the beautiful things. Never one. Now, I didn't. I wasn't rude enough to say, well, did you learn anything? That just wasn't me. But uh, I'm sure she didn't learn a thing. But she just, uh, she, was, she was so astonished by the beauty of this church. And this is the way the disciples were leaving the temple. And they would say, uh, and so they kept looking at this building. And so our Lord had to get on them. They kept looking at the building because it was beautiful. So our Lord got on them and he said, Stop looking at the buildings. I tell you the truth, not one stone will be left here on another and will be torn down. Now, the principle is that the disciples were enamored by buildings. The building was beautiful, but the building's not the issue. And the disciples are admiring something that is absolutely inconsequential. Inconsequential. Absolutely inconsequential. There's no spiritual... There's no... You can't live a spiritual life by looking at a pretty building. And then point two. Stop looking at buildings. This is a point of doctrine that they were getting. The fifth cycle is coming and this building will be gone. Destroyed. It's all going to be destroyed. Stop looking at the buildings. I can see how our Lord would be very frustrated with these nitwits. Everywhere they go... They're always interested in something except what he has to say. And he's been teaching doctrine, and he just excoriated the religious crowd. And then, once he excoriates the religious crowd, he leaves the temple, mentally separates himself from the religious crowd, and the only thing the disciples can do is hang their tongues out and look at Herod's temple. How frustrating. You might not understand it. I understand. He's frustrated because he's been trying to teach them something, and the only thing they can see is a building. They have their eyes on things rather than on eternity. A terrible thing. And so the disciples messed up, but they uh, grow in grace and in knowledge later. So we will continue with this study Sunday. And we will go into the Olivet Discourse into more detail. And I'll make sure that I get every dispensational thing down right and correct. Because I tell you something. These uh, passages here are dealing with dispensationalism. And they are dealing with things that are... Uh, well, you have to know your dispensations to understand what's about to be said. If you don't understand dispensations... You won't understand these passages. Now, I got some letters today. They were confused about the dispensations, and I can understand why, as I taught it the other day. But I taught it correctly, but I'll go back over it to make it very clear. That's why I did a little review today.
These things deal with dispensation. And they deal with the tribulation. They deal even with the church age. And you say, but the church isn't here yet, but our Lord foreshadowed it. It deals with the church age. It deals with the tribulation. It deals with the certain things that are happening right then in the Old Testament. And it even deals with the millennium, things that are going to happen in the millennium. So before you can ever understand Matthew, you must understand dispensation and dispensations. And the most horrible thing that has happened today is that people have tried to look at Matthew without knowing dispensations, and therefore they've concluded that this is the end of times and that the whole world's about to uh, fall apart and the resurrection will occur in ten years from now. But the problem is they've been doing this for years after years. In the 1980s, Hal Lindsey wrote a book that the resurrection would occur in 1988. It's 2005! <laughs> so, with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity to study this portion of the Word. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us concerning these things so that we might grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. May we come to understand the importance of dispensations, and may we come to understand that we in the church age live in the most unique dispensation ever in which we can fulfill our unique spiritual life and become invisible heroes where those in the past could not. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen.